You felt at his death what? Um, well, death of, death of father is a, is a many-layered thing. Um, and I, we saw it coming. I mean, he was, he was dying for a good two months. Um, and the suspense was really more of how we'd take it, how the family would take it, rather than what Kingsley's destiny was, because that was clear enough. Um, well, you feel, you feel much closer to death yourself. Uh, you feel you've lost a part of yourself, a, a part of yourself and, and, and a part of your armor. Uh, and you're, you're more vulnerable, you're m more naked in the face of death. Um, but you also feel that you're, you're taking your place um, in the evolutionary sense, that you're, you're coming into your own, moving forward in your life. Uh, not very pleasant feeling either. The father, the father stands, you know, protects you from, from having to think about death by his own existence, because your, your turn hasn't come yet. Yeah. You know? His passing suggests that, in the sense of no many years off, that it's put you next in line, so That's to speak, right. oh, in yeah. your own hierarchy. You're, you're in the front, uh, suddenly. You called Saul Bellow, who's a very, very as close a, as, to you as well, one he, can imagine. He's, um, he's really a hero of mine, uh, uh, and a mentor, as well as a friend. And I, yes, it's interesting because I, I'm usually very reluctant to ring Saul because um, I wanted to get on with what yeah, he's writing. You're taken away from his work. Yeah, and I wanted him to get on with his work so I can read it. Um, but I did sort of on automatic, really, I called him. And he, um, and I said, you know, I said, you'll have to be my father now. And funnily enough, I won't feel entirely fatherless while he's still around. I fell from the trapeze onto the safety net of Saul. And when he dies, I'll fall from the safety net onto the ground, but it's not such a, a big drop. Um, and that is, you know, uh, of immense value to me. I feeling. never, you, you make this point too, which I have never quite understand, d understood. You say that you are his ideal reader, and Christopher Hitchens is your father's ideal reader. Right. Um, <clears throat> What I mean by ideal reader was, um, was very much made apparent to me uh, when I read for the third time his novel, Ravelstein. Um, and I, what it means is this, it's quite simple. I just, I couldn't imagine anyone getting more out of this book than I was getting. The, the complexity of pleasure that it gave me, um, I would defy anyone to love that book as much as I, I was loving it as I finished it. And that's all I mean. And there's some areas of my dad's stuff that, that I don't respond to. But Christopher Hitchens, funnily enough, seems to, seems to follow it all. And it resonates more with him than it does with you. Exactly. I mean, I, I love my father's stuff, but there's some bits that, that don't work for me, and they do work for him. What happened in this relationship with this fellow, Jacoby? Jacobs. Jacobs. Eric Jacobs. Um, well, I... I include an, an appendix on this. You'll notice that there aren't many complaints about the press, um, although there's a hell of a lot to complain about. Um, <laughs> but this did seem to me uh, uh, egregious. Um, he was my father's biographer, and he was around a good deal and was a much valued friend in the last weeks of my father's life, which were difficult weeks, as you can imagine. And Eric was a kind of family insider. He was a family friend and he did great things like taking my father into hospital at a critical point. Um, then 72 hours after my father died, I got a call from him saying that he'd kept notes during this period and he, the Sunday Times was interested in publishing them. And I thought they would be dull and anodyne, as the biography is. Uh, and he sent them around and it was, um, it was as if into, you know, into our china shop. He had come with little family feelings and uh, sensitivities. He had come bullocking in uh, and, and seemed to be suffering from the delusion that uh, it, was a, it was only he who, um, who, had a, who had any feeling for Kingsley, ridiculously. Okay, but what I'm trying to understand, what was the egregious, most egregious sin that he committed? 
uh, he contaminated our grief. He assailed us in our grief. You know, it says it in the Bible, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, um, and not assailed with these uh, revelations. Um, he was just mourning deathbed, and grief. deathbed snooping is what it amounted to. Um, and of course, when he agreed to withdraw the, the, um, his jottings, as he called them, but published them a few months later, and I expected, we had fired him, the family had fired him from editing my father's letters. Right. Not out of revenge, but because we, we never wanted to set eyes on him ever again, and um, so we severed all connection with him. And when he did go public with these jottings, I expected the press to um, be on the f side of the family. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that would be appropriate? But in fact, uh, I looked on with fascination as the press kind of 50 50 its way into the vacuum. We have a tradition in England that my father called pernicious neutrality, where opposed views are given equal play. Um, and this, this means that the press is reduced to a kind of elephantine impotence, because it's on the one hand this, on the one hand that, and they can't see a moral issue when it stares them in the face. On some issues, there's no only one side. Yeah, that's right. And, outright condemnation from all quarters is demanded by the facts.